Hello, everybody. Welcome to this webinar where we will address uh, risk assessment of uh, locust swarms and, and invasions. It is in a very uh, relevant and timely issue. It's uh, uh, We have a severe uh, situation there in East Africa, and that is what we are going to talk about in this webinar. My name is Bente Liliabi. I'm going to be your host today. And before we really start, this is a part of my signature uh, webinar, and that is that we do a, a little bit of a weather reporting before we start so that people can um, get on this webinar before the, the real program is starting. So with that, we just start with the weather report. So I will start with you, Kisito. Can you give us a weather report from and tell us where you are? Okay, um, that's interesting. Um, my name is Kisito. I am... Uh, joining from Darmstadt in Germany and um, even though it's springtime um, we have um, I think eight degrees outside looking from my laptop it's uh, gloomy and rainy and very cold uh, nothing to look forward to for the weekend in terms of weather oh oh my goodness oh well okay well then we move to Dennis Where Hello are everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Hello everyone. This is Dennis. I'm calling from a grey um, Nairobi, Nairobi in Kenya. Um, I work with uh, RC Madi. We uh, should be reporting some 18 degrees or so uh, wherever I am. Uh, so so that, that's home enough <laughs> for <laughs> us. And I look forward to this webinar. Thank you for that report, uh, Kenneth. Uh, how about you? Hello, everybody. My name is Kenneth Mwangi, Kenneth Kemoshe Mwangi, and I'm reporting from Nairobi. The weather is sunny with clouds, uh, intermittent clouds, and it's a bit chilly. It's supposed to be raining this time of the year. We're, suppo we're, uh, we're supposed to be in the rainy season, but, well, uh, it's still not yet raining as uh, we're expecting. And it's about 22 degrees outside. Lovely for some hike, but we're staying indoors. <laughs> we are staying indoors, yes. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, Catherine, how about you? Hi, everyone. I'm in Kampala. It is a very hot, sunny day. It's about 26 degrees. It's very clear skies. There's very little pollution since everybody is at home, uh, as Kenneth has said. Um, it's actually very fresh air. The only problem is that it's really, really hot and humid. So it's actually not very pleasant to walk outside. Um, yeah. Okay, and we, we go to, we let you speak to Lillian since you are here. Lillian, mm -hmm. can you give a report, <laughs> a weather report? Uh, we can't hear you. Sorry. Um, so I'm, I'm Lilian and I'm in Nairobi as well. And oh. it looks sunny outside and it's sad that we can't go out and play. So, Okay, yes. We have three Nairobians here with different, <laughs> different uh, weather reports. Thank you. So I will give a report. I, I Well, I, I could have show, turn you the, the screen and show that it's actually snowing here now. But early this morning, it was a sunshine. I'm placed in the Arctic just beyond the Arctic Circle uh, in a place called Buda in Norway. And typically in the spring, it's like all sorts of weather within two minutes. So <laughs> it's very shifting. <laughs> <clears throat> we had eyes on the sea this morning. So it's, uh, it's, you know, below zero. So with that, that was the reporting. I think we are ready to start. I will use this opportunity to ask you attendees welcome all of you to also give us some re weather reports tell us where you're from and um, a few words on the weather we we specifically maybe it's just me in norway we love to talk about the weather so <laughs> it's always <laughs> it's always re relevant so please do uh, use the chat box actively that's what we want you to do ask questions and comments as you hear the speakers present their uh, information so um, today, with this webinar will last about an hour. Uh, we have four speakers. We will cover different aspects of, um, of the challenge, um, the desert locust. And uh, we will um, have questions in between. 
a few questions in between. So if you have questions, we, I will try to, to ask them in between. We will have a special uh, room after Catherine is, uh, has given her speak because uh, she has to leave. But apart from that, we will have a Q&A at the end of the session. There is a replay of this webinar and you will get the uh, slides that you will see also on planforall.eu because this webinar is part of the Inspire, the Kampala Inspire Hackathon and uh, you will learn more about that from Kisito. So Kisito will start to introduce a challenge, the, um, uh, the, the, the risk anal analysis and risk mitigation of uh, locust uh, invasion. And then we will learn different uh, perspectives uh, on using Earth observations. So Catherine will talk about the NASA capacities uh, and um, Kenneth will show us or, or explain how that is being used locally. And finally, well, no, that, that's Dennis who will do the, the regional uh, applications of it. So, uh, but there will be uh, a lot about Earth observation and how we can use that to uh, analyze the risk of locust swarms and invasion. So with that, Kisito, I think I will give the floor to you to start and introduce us to the challenge. Okay, uh, great. Thanks so much, uh, Bente. Let me just take a um, 10 second break to upload my screen. So I will turn off my video. Yeah. And... We will all turn off our cameras while the the speakers are speaking but we will come back to you i promise so with everybody's turning off their cameras and uh, and there and, and we are muting ourselves also while casito is talking okay great so uh, just give me a signal if you're able to see my screen uh, benta yes we can see it okay perfect Yes, uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining our webinar this morning. Um, we are, um, I am a mentor of the fourth challenge of the Kampala Inspire Hackathon. My name is Kizito Diambo. Uh, brief introduction about myself. I am uh, the CEO and founder of an agri-tech startup that is based in Germany called Agribora. And Agribora is uh, all about making farmers visible by using different uh, data and location-based insights. Uh, most of the insights that we are using are based on uh, geodata. So we are georeferencing the farms uh, where the farmers are working and are monitoring the development of these fields uh, based on satellite data, uh, weather data, and data that farmers are giving into the system. Um, my interest in this topic is basically uh, looking at how the impact of locusts is affecting the agricultural production in the current uh, season. Um, yeah, so the, I would like to briefly talk about uh, the the Inspire, the, the Kampala Inspire Hackathon um, <clears throat> all together. So the Hackathon is basically um, a platform for us to ideate on uh, activities that promote sustainability across Africa. And the Kampala Hackathon is looking at different topics uh, ranging not only from agriculture, but also to environmental sustainability, collaborative open innovation and ICT uh, enabled entrepreneurship. We have, um, if I'm not wrong, around 10 uh, different um, hackathon challenges that are ongoing at the moment. And the Desert Locust Hackathon is one of these hackathon um, challenges. Um, the Kampala Inspire Hackathon is one of uh, many hackathons that are being uh, run across uh, the world uh, from coordinated by Plan for All. Uh, we are having other hackathons that are, go that are happening uh, in Dropnik and in Prague. So um, we were very happy because the Kampala Inspire Hackathon um, was very successful last year when we were having uh, actually the, Nai the Nairobi Inspire Hackathon with over 200 participants. And we are happy that this year we are able to have another hackathon on the African continent. And now we are in uh, Kampala. So 
as a hackathon, sometimes we look at hackathons as a competition where there is a prize to be won. But for us, uh, we are using the Inspire hackathons basically to bring um, minds together to collect ideas for challenges that we are facing right now in the different sectors and look at how we can uh, build up these ideas for future research, innovation and collaboration. So. Um, it is still possible for all of you to take part in these hackathons. I have shared a link here that will take you to the registration site where you can be able to access uh, the different hackathons and you can uh, participate in them. Um, I am also sharing with you here some of the organizers of the participating organizations that are working um, on, this, uh, on this hackathon. So going into the Desert Locust Hackathon, um, maybe uh, briefly to just let you know, we have around 12 participants as of this morning that are taking part in the fourth challenge, the Desert Locust Hackathon, coming from different countries um, across um, in Africa and in um, Europe. And we also have uh, somebody from Iran, which is very interesting for us to look at the different perspectives of how to access this challenge. Um, the participants have different biographies uh, ranging from uh, geospatial to uh, ep epidemiologists and um, statisticians. Uh, so we are basically looking at anybody who is interested in this challenge and looking at how we're able to work together on it. We have three mentors in this um, in this um, in this hackathon. Uh, or in our challenge. Um, one is uh, Lilian Dungu from the Regional Center of Mapping for Resources uh, for Development. We have Paul Kasoma, uh, Paul Kasoma, um, sorry, their main, the name is written wrongly there, from the Youth in Technology and Development who is based in Uganda. And uh, most of our work, we are coordinating it through Skype. So we have also shared here the Skype link. So feel free to join that to also get in touch with us um, all the time and we can continue the discussions. The hackathon is running right from March and is going to end uh, on the 8th of May. Um, ideally, we wanted to have uh, the end of this hackathon uh, during a conference in Uganda in May, but due to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we are basically doing the whole event as a virtual event. Um, the challenge that we're looking at in this hackathon is basically, uh, we are seeing that across East Africa, there has been an infestation of locusts uh, from the end of 2019, and uh, they're growing in numbers, and we're basically looking at the second or third generation of these locusts that are moving across the region. Now, it, it poses a big challenge to not only the local livelihoods of smallholder farmers, but also food, sec food security for the region. So the goal of our challenge here is to identify uh, better and innovative ways of forecasting and monitoring uh, the spread of these locusts and to look for better ways um, of basically preserving human life and crop life. So looking at um, which ideas do we have of maybe not just spraying over regions um, um, uh, uh, chemicals or pesticides, do we have any other ideas of how we can um, mitigate on these challenges? So the activities that we are involved in are on the one hand looking at uh, mapping uh, the habitats and forecasting the spread of this locust to understand uh, the region where uh, this is uh, this is happening. But on the other hand, we are also looking at the impact. So how is that impacting the lives of the different people at the moment? How do we quantify that? And how do we also maybe look at the implications of on the current uh, season for livestock and uh, for crops? Um, so we are already collecting ideas from participants and some of the ideas that I just want to share with you here um, to just uh, give a perspective is how can we maybe use uh, drones uh, to collect data from the ground that can help us in the mapping or the monitoring of the, of the challenge and uh, also looking at real-time mapping and forecasting and also looking at how can we inform the citizens about uh, what is happening. Are we able to give them um, a tool that can help to them to see if there is a possibility of the locusts affecting the region and what are some of the mitigation measures that they can put in place? Um, and how does that affect the income of uh, the smallholder farmers who are already worried that this is going to affect uh, their income for this year? Um, something else that we're looking at is uh, looking also from the other side, uh, how can we actually look at the locusts as an alternative source for livestock feed? Um, how can we be able to 
use this uh, also as an advantage to promote maybe uh, better livestock feeds uh, from the locust and um, also looking at the, ch at the perspective of minimizing the effect of pesticides that we are using for uh, for the pesticides uh, for, for for mitigating the challenge of the locust yeah and of course we welcome many other ideas that you would have um, basically we want to work together to develop ideas that we can further build on even after the kampala inspire hackathon ends in may um i have sent i will send a link also here in the chat box where you can register and i'm very i'm very very interested and uh, looking forward to the um, presentations by our experts here who are basically going to help us look at the lessons learned so far by the different um, organizations that are helping to uh, um, monitor and also curb the challenge of the desert locusts. So with that said, Bente, I will um, give the floor to our experts to basically give us uh, some of um, the lessons learned and share with us um, yeah, their presentations. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Kisito. And uh, while you have been presenting, there's uh, there's been a lot of sharing in the um, <laughs> of information in the, the the chat box so the links have been shared many times can you please uh come back to the room um, yes. in the, with the, the photos yes. the videos um yes so if you have any questions uh to uh Kisito now you can ask them very quickly but some of the questions were where's the the skype <laughs> Where's ah, the okay. Skype chat group and and um, a, a, a request for for information and thank you so much for your interest. Uh, that that's this is a really good sign <laughs> um, for for this challenge. Let me see if I have um, yes. I I wanted to to uh, uh, draw your attention to one comment from Ratna, um, saying that in northern Laos the bamboo locust invasion has increased uh, from 140 locations to 500 locations last year. And even though they are not the same as the desert locusts, they are still doing a lot of, of uh, damage. So there is, it's a generic, well, generic uh, a, a problem, a challenge that has interest beyond the desert locust, which I think is uh, interesting that we are addressing it here and they yes. find it useful, yeah. yeah. So thank you for that, Ratna, to to alert us to that. And then you mentioned somebody in Iran also has uh, has a challenge with with locust. Uh, so no, no. So basically, this is um, this is um, this is an expert um, on pesticides from Iran oh. who is basically monitoring the desert locust challenge in Africa, and he's very interested in it. And we are happy that oh. he is offering his expertise to our team to also look at the effect of pesticides. On, ah, um, yeah. on desert locusts because uh, we are seeing that across East Africa we are sp we are spraying with helicopters over agricultural fields. So looking ah. at what what challenge what impact does that have on um, on the on the on the vegetation and also on uh, on human life? Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, I see. Yes. So with that, I don't see any more <clears throat> questions right now. I just um, and but I realized I was skipping one important thing, and that is that I I forgot to ask you to introduce yourself to do a tour de table. So we just you just did the weather report and not tell anybody anything about yourself. So Casito, you did it by yourself. But now I think before we let uh, let Catherine speak, uh, we can do a tour de table. So Catherine, you can start to introduce yourself very shortly so that we get to know you. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Catherine Nakalembe. I'm an assistant research professor at the University of Maryland. I work for the NASA Harvest Program, which is NASA's uh, program on agriculture monitoring. I'm also uh, on the Severe Applied Sciences team, which is a NASA capacity, capacity building program. And interested a lot, I'm really interested in working on remote sensing and agriculture and food security, primarily in Eastern Africa. Very interesting. Thank you, Catherine, and apologies for not letting you introducing yourself. Uh, Dennis, how about you? Can you? What are you doing? Hello, everyone. Dennis here. I work with RCMRD, the Regional Center for Mapping of Resources for Development in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, I am an environmental scientist. Uh, 
um, one of the thematic leads within uh, Surveyor projects. Okay. We host the Surveyor Eastern and, and Southern African Hub. There are, there are five more hubs across the world. And I'm in charge mainly of, uh, of research and development um, in weather and climate thematic area. Interesting. Thank you. And then Kenneth? Unmute yourself. Sorry for that. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kenneth Mwangi, and I work at Eager Climate Prediction and Application Center. And I'm a remote sensing specialist, and I work in uh, remote sensing applied in environment monitoring and agriculture monitoring at a regional scale. Thank you. And we have one of the other mentors with us today as well. Lillian, can you uh, use the opportunity to introduce yourself? Uh, hello everyone, I'm Lillian Dungu. I work at RCMRD as the Agriculture and Food Security Lead. And um, I'm passionate about agriculture and using our observation and all these technologies to not just do research, but also to create products and services that are changing lives. And that is why we are here. Thank you. Thank you, Lillian. So nice to have all of you here. Thank you so much. And now we are ready for you, Catherine. So we turn off our uh, cameras <clears throat> and Catherine will turn on her sound as well. We don't hear you, Catherine. We saw your presentation, but... Can you hear me now? We hear you, but now the screen is black. <laughs> How about now? Can yes. you see my screen? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Go ahead. Um, uh, thanks, everybody, and thanks for this invitation to uh, share a little bit about um, what we've been doing. I just give a I'll just give a brief context about uh, my involvement in all of this. Like I've I've already introduced myself, so I'll just skip over this. But I just wanted to mention that um, a lot of the work that I'm doing and that we're doing under NASA Harvest and particularly with Sevilla focusing on our culture food security is sort of contributing to this bigger um, initiative called GeoGlam, which is the global, um, it's a global initiative, GEO, which is Group on Earth Observations Global Culture Monitoring. And really it is GEO's initiative focusing on uh, enhancing the use of earth observations to improve the international community's capacity to produce and disseminate relevant, timely, uh, useful information on, on crops and food security. Um, and the program that I primarily work for at the University of Maryland is a NASA Harvest uh, program, which was launched in 2017. Uh, it focuses on using Earth observations. It is NASA's contribution to the GeoGlam initiative. It is end user driven, so we work a lot with uh, uh, national governments, uh, private sector uh, organizations, other research organizations to try and, and really understand what the needs are and then try to provide uh, solutions that uh, keep uh, within the capabilities of remote sensing. Um, I also wanted to mention uh, that part of my work uh, in Eastern Africa um, is supported by the SEVERE program, uh, which is a global uh, program. It has hubs in uh, many regions in the world. And uh, in Eastern Southern Africa, we work with RCMRD, both Lillian and Dennis are from RCMRD and they're thematic leads and I've been working with them closely. I've also been working closely with uh, Kenneth on a lot of uh, GeoGlam harvest uh, and SEVERE activities. And um, just really quickly, I guess this might be useful for those participating in the hackathon, just to understand where Earth observations, you know, should sort of be an integral part of uh, uh, some of the solutions or a lot of the solutions uh, in terms of dealing with the current invasion is that um, with satellite, when I say Earth observation, I mean satellite data, particularly. Um, it's timely, objective, and repeatable, so we can get uh, almost daily images of the whole globe and try and understand how conditions are, vegetation conditions, crop conditions. And with further analysis and integration of uh, algorithms and machine learning and um, higher resolution data sets, for example, we can start to say specifically, this is how maize is doing, how beans are doing. Uh, the other thing that uh, satellite data provide is that 
this global coverage does not give you, you know, does not only give you this uh, overview of the whole globe, but you can use the same data to look at very different landscapes. And there are limitations, of course, when you look at these images here, how the same size um, area on land appears when you're looking at agriculture. I love these three images, one from uh, Eastern France, one from Western Kenya, one from Northern Uganda. You can see that uh, there are much smaller fields in uh, Northern Uganda, there's slightly larger fields in Western Kenya and uh, sort of a mix of, uh, we can look at, we can call it like planting dates. So you have to be able to, to see all of that in order to provide really critical information about what's really going on with crops and satellite data allow you that. We have a long dense time record. So if you wanted to know what, it, what the impact of a drought this year is, uh, one of the ways to do that is to look at the long-term average. How is right now comparing to the last um, 30 years and um, Satellite data allow us to do that pretty much for everywhere in the world when you're looking at um, the MODIS satellite that has provided data for, I think we're looking at 19, 20 years. It's since 2000, since the year 2000. And so this becomes really important. Also, and I'll, I'll, I'll hint on that when I'm talking about the locus, uh, uh, some of our locus work. The methods that we can develop with uh, Earth observations allow us to look at these very different landscapes and really understand what is going on. Uh, you can gauge and know where crops are irrigated, where they're not irrigated. So if there's a severe drought, you would know in places where they're not irrigated, you can clearly see that there is an impact on, um, on, on condition. And then um, low cost. Low cost here just means that if you can integrate additional data, and this is very important for the locust monitoring, if we have good ground data, you can further uh, leverage what the earth observations can give you. So if we know that there are locusts in place A, this is the level of damage on the ground, you could look at a satellite image and see if there's, you know, there's uh, some evidence of that in the satellite image and then try to look for other places within uh, uh, the satellite data that you have and say, all right, it looks like on the state there were locusts in place A, this is the level of damage, what it looks like, and then you run an algorithm and then try and find where else that has happened. So you can get a sort of a bigger overview of what's happening. Just some examples of the work, uh, sort of the um, um, uh, implementation of our work. Uh, this is just uh, some of the global and regional work that we're doing, uh, part of, um, uh, the GeoGlam initiative. We have the Crop Monitor for AMIS, the Crop Monitor for Early Warning, the Eastern Africa Crop Monitor, which uh, Kenneth is leading and coordinating. We've had uh, uh, Tanzania Food Security Bulletin, the Uganda Integrated Early Warning Bulletin, the Kenya Crop Conditions Bulletin. Uh, there's one in development for Rwanda and Mali, and all of these just help uh, national agencies and regional agencies sort of come up and converge information about what's going on. So fast forward into the desert locust, just to give an overview of what we've been doing. I brought these four images because I thought they were interesting, just to show the level of coordination. This, uh, the first one is from, I think it's from the December, uh, December 2019 Eastern Africa Crop Monitor, and it just shows uh, sort of how this information is being shared. So the locusts arrive in Ethiopia and things are looking a certain way. Uh, Fast forward, this is from February 15th, 2020 for Uganda. The locusts arrived in Uganda and they were trying to show projections of where they would go. And there, this information is being published in this, uh, this, this bulletins that I showed initially. Um, we have here, this is the current crop monitor for, for early warning uh, bulletin, which has been trying to keep updating, updating what's happening with the swarms. And this is the map actually from coming out of the EGAD Climate Predictions and Application Center about the current uh, progress or status of the desert locusts. And um, I mean, just to quote, and I don't know if I'm preempting Kenneth's uh, presentation, that it is urgent and it's serious that the swarms uh, are coming up. So just to talk about um, how we've been approaching this, um, earlier in February, we sort of started this working group uh, with, uh, with a team uh, that 
a combination of uh, myself from NASA Havas and, and, and NASA Sevier, and uh, we have uh, partners including USAID, FuseNet. Uh, we have uh, it's a big, big range of partners, including the FAO Waffle Program. And really, what we wanted to do is to try and synthesize all the information that's out there and try to come up with. Because at the time, we were getting a lot of information about locusts. It's the same as what's happening with uh, COVID nineteen. There's maps uh, spring. Uh, coming up from everywhere. Um, and so we thought, well, what can we do with Earth observations? What we learned really quickly is that in terms of the science and how you can monitor track and, and, and understand what's happening, all of that has been developed because lo desert locusts are not new. And so uh, this is an example of what satellite data can, can sort of give you. This image right here on the left, image A, is uh, coming from the Early Warning Explorer, which is a, a, a tool that was developed under Severe Applied Sciences Team Project. And what it helps you do is you can look at rainfall and temperature and look at rainfall forecasts. And um, what, I'm trying to, what I'm trying to show here is that this intense rainfall during October, November, December, which is uh, typically supposed to be a dry season, uh, not a dry season, sort of a, a wettish season, but then it continued into January. It was such huge moisture, particularly if you look at uh, further up in the Horn of Africa, um, that led to anomalously green conditions. And these green conditions, so uh, basically provide uh, food for the locusts. So they has, the soils have to be wet, that's one thing. Um, I think, I mean, for those who are part of the, the hackathon, being able to do that background would really be helpful. Uh, the soils have to be moist. There has to be some vegetation. The soils have to be sandy because the eggs have to be laid a little bit, uh, you know, below the surface. And um, what that basically did, it fueled this, it fed uh, the locusts. And then, and Kenneth, I think, will speak to this. Uh, the cyclone that happened, Cyclone Puan, created even more moisture. Pawan, I think it's called, created more moisture and then provided wind conditions to drive the, the locusts. And kind of to explain this a little bit, a lot better than I can. Um, just to show you also the time series data coming out of that satellite modus that I mentioned before, we have, uh, you know, we have 20 years data. And you can see that for Kenya, if you're looking just at Kenya generically, uh, the conditions over January to March 15th, I think it's still continuing to, to date, are way above average in terms of vegetation conditions. So if we're trying to assess uh, locust damage uh, to vegetation, it's really, really complex because the, the vegetation is so green that it would be very difficult to look at damage coming out of defoliation from the locusts eating the, the plants or from um, from just a regular senescence. sense. And so we're trying uh, sort of smart and different ways to try and look at it instead of looking at the long-term anomaly. So now versus the long-term average, we're trying to look at rapid uh, degradation in the NDVI. So we're looking at, was there a very significant drop in NDVI at a certain point in place A? And so we're trying to, uh, get as much field data as possible and try and find these points where locusts arrive when they arrive and then look at the long time time series. And so this is just also showing you what else you could see with the satellite data, everything from the long term NDVI, this is for Eastern Kenya, uh, uh, temperature, precipitation, it's just a different way to view the data so that you can sort of uh, really inform um, your analysis. Uh, another data set that we're looking at is called CIF, and we're also trying to look at other newer things uh, like EcoStress, which we're really not very familiar with uh, with using. So we're trying to figure it out because it's a much higher resolution data set. But uh, just so I explain what these two images here are showing is that this is EVI. Um, the anomaly for 2020 versus December 2019, you can see that there's a very, a very, very uh, big uh, change. And then this is CIF, which is a little bit more pixelated because it's a much, it's a little bit significantly higher res. And um, so we're really trying to figure out that all of this noise, if you want to call it noise, where exactly is uh, the, the the change in NDVI, where can it be attributed to, um, to desert locusts? And then um, 
also the Earth observations data, this ties into what Kizito just said um, about uh, setting up a system for monitoring. So FAO has had this system, I think it's called Ramses, and uh, it's very, it works very well in West Africa. Uh, it, it, it has some, some problems and they're trying to improve it, but um, there are data sets that are required to be in it, for example, soy moisture. So satellite data can actually help with this because having ground measures of soy moisture uh, is very, very, it's very, very expensive. It's very, very expensive to maintain, set up and all of that. And so satellite data can be a good way to sort of come up with soy moisture data. The other thing is, um, uh, generally, in terms of what else you could do with the satellite data is uh, looking at vegetation, of course, the soil moisture, of course, is useful also for uh, desert locust monitoring. And in terms of sort of what we've learned so far is that um, East, East Africa versus West Africa, there's a uh, very distinct uh, history of desert locusts. So in West Africa, they get these a lot more, so there's a lot more ex ex experience. They're uh, sort of continuous capacity ongoing. There are places that are designated frontline countries. There's a training, there are experts in the region. And that sort of is not something that's very common in East Africa because we don't get desert locusts a lot. Um, and one of the other problems is that where the breeding started this uh, from from this invasion is in areas that were largely uh, insecure. So even ground control operations, which are very critical for locust monitoring. So the earlier you do it, the better uh, were not possible. In terms of expertise, like I said before, there are a lot more, I believe, uh, a lot more locust, does it locust uh, experts in West Africa than there are in East Africa. So relying on the knowledge that's in West Africa is would be really critical. The biggest gap, I think, and maybe Kenneth will add on this as well, is having consistent continuous field data. So reporting when they arrived, what they looked like, where they're breeding, what state they are, how big the swarms are, is very important. This is this is largely lacking. And perhaps, I mean, with the lockdown, of course, it's going to be even much more complex. But perhaps one way would be to figure out a way to get farmers who are in their fields to be able to communicate that information um, Georeferenced information, more specifically, and then uh, the other thing I think as part of this challenge is how to be able to share actionable data with farmers. So we know where they are. Let's say we figure out where they are. How, what do you tell farmers to do? Farmers who might not have access to pesticides, um, and then working with them to monitor. Of course, having them be a part of that network of people that are sending information, and then of course, there's uh, remote sensing that been leveraged as much as it should, but that's largely because, you know, the sy that system that's required to be there to support to support the monitoring and action is not, has not been in place. And of course, COVID-19 uh, is affecting ground control operations. It's affecting everything from supplies to uh, people who have to go out in the field, people who have to do training, uh, experts who can help support, can't travel. So it's, it's very complex. And I think this is probably my last slide. So food security uh, is gonna be a big, big, big problem, I guess many, many years. Cause we were initially when they were talking about desert locusts is saying it's gonna be bad for, for a really long time if the locust swarms, you know, become multiple, multiple swarms. But now with COVID-19, it is a whole other ball game. And I think just wanted to show this, that it's a partnership working with many, many, many people. And I will just stop there. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Catherine. That was uh, a lot of very interesting and valuable uh, information and knowledge. Um, we have gotten a lot of uh, questions uh, for you. Well, can I ask you first, when do you have to go, Catherine? At the top uh, of the hour. At the top of the hour, yes. okay. So just uh, before we will, um, there's a lot of questions here and we will ask them. Uh, but before we do that, I would like to uh, make a comment and clarification on the term Earth observation, because you were using it interchangeably. Uh, and with satellite and, data. Yes, so very often it's used as satellite data only. You say Earth observation and you mean satellite data or remote sensing, uh, but uh, Earth observation in GEO in the group of Earth observation is actually much wider as any type of Earth observation, meaning also field or ground truth in C2 observations. And and you were and you were you were talking about that in your presentation that how that 
feel data <laughs> is is making the making the quality or the interpretation of the satellite data uh, more powerful. So yeah. we need both, and Earth yes, yes. In, yes, and Earth yes. in general is the whole package of yes. Earth observations. Yeah. Yes, I think I mean just to, just to just to I guess to say it in like one three four words is that uh, remote sensing data makes a lot more sense makes sense is much more useful when you have ground information so actually for training validation for really understanding if I told you there was a severe drought but I had a picture of it you would get it much better and that picture is much more informative than a pixel so yes absolutely yeah yeah on many levels so just a clarification because i know that that's a question we we uh we get often we had this in a, another webinar also what exactly is earth observation so with that i think we thank you so much for all the the questions uh, i don't know if you noticed the my my the rest of the room here but we have gotten so many questions thank you for this and comments as well so we will start let me see where we are um, um, please, can we think of how to protect the locust and to protect the locust and maybe divert the location to minimize the damage on farming? Um, is there any uh, I, is there any way that this information that you you get from from this observations that you can Will that play a role in in mitigating the locust swarms? I think, I mean, a, a combination of, I think the most critical thing from what I've learned in the past few months is uh, being able to destroy, I don't like that word, to destroy the locusts <laughs> before they start flying. So that requires being able to map the breeding grounds. When you map the breeding grounds, uh, you, need, you need soil moisture, soil type, um, you know, and some sort of, any ground information that tells you that you know a locust arrived here a few weeks ago or they're on the ground they look like this or they're their eggs here so if you could destroy the eggs yes one of the most important things actually the other thing that i learned uh, from um his name is my guy he's from severe west africa he said that uh pesticides are not the best way to deal with them so if they have these sort of other methods you dig holes and trap them in the holes they all crawl in there and then you could it's such a very bad thing to talk about a species, but then you can just set them on fire in the holes, and then you would you would be able to control them right you know right before they become gregarious and uh, you know fly square miles of swarms, which can destroy everything pretty much. Yeah, it's I mean it's a matter of life and death, so uh, so we have to talk about it like that. I guess <laughs> it's just a brutal reality of nature. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Ratna is asking, what data or information will NASA Harvest have that Mekong region countries can use for plant protection? Do you know this, Catherine? For plant protection or for for the for locust monitoring as well? Um, I'm not quite sure, but uh, Ratna has another one. Maybe that's easier to uh, to answer. Do you have information on the use of NASA Harvest tools in Mekong region? Um, I actually can send, a, I'll, I'll post the link here to the severe Mekong region. Uh, let's see, I'll, I'll paste it um, after the question, I'll, I'll put it in there. Yeah, uh, There's a lot of uh, stuff going on in severe Mekong, which is really, really cool stuff. And I, I would recommend going to see that, that website. Excellent, thank you. So Emmy is asking, what was the extent and destruction of recent locust emission in Eastern Uganda? Was it, was it there anyway? That's that. It goes back to the field data part. Uh, uh, we hear about these operations on the ground, but there is no coordinated way to keep track of who was doing what. I've seen pictures of so many dead locusts, but we can't really tell where they are. No. Um, but from what I've, I've what I learned a few days ago from FAO is that uh, the swarms that come into Uganda primarily come from Kenya because the, the breeding conditions are much better in Western Kenya than they are in Uganda. So it will be, they'll be coming in waves. And so, I don't know. I mean, I don't have the correct answer to that for sure. No, but that's an, that's an interesting question for the challenge maybe. So um, 
um, Paul asking, what specific tools or technology can we use from the NASA harvest to monitor locust movement as well as perform risk assessment? You partly answer it, but maybe you will add something, Catherine. No, maybe I, maybe I won't answer it and leave it to Kenneth. Because uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I think yeah. Kenneth will give a really good answer to this uh, yeah. to this question. We can save it for him. It will yeah, be much better. Yeah, yes, we save it. They have some very advanced tools uh, and it will be great to hear from Kenneth. Okay, Paul, you will get it too. He's the expert. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Wambua is asking, where are the locusts concentrated now? Since the COVID pandemic hit, we are not getting any news in Kenya. The yeah. last we heard where they were in the western part of the country towards Uganda. I'll leave this to Kenneth as well. Uh, yes. Um, I'll, I'll leave it to Kenneth. I mean, I can sort of try to answer it, but I, I won't do a very yeah, no, I won't do a great job. Yes. But um, <laughs> I will also post. I'll also post a link to the FAO website. Uh, I'll add a link to the recent report from ICPAC, as Kenneth is presenting. I'll, I'll try and post as many resources uh, in the chat window. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, yeah we, we have to keep the suspense also in the webinar here, so people are getting more in the future part of the webinar. Okay, Elias is asking or first commenting, IGAD has uh, released a prediction map on the possible locust invasion in May or June 2020 in the most East African countries. I therefore would like to know how this has been done and data sources used to produce this results. Anybody knows this? Kenneth. Kenneth. Question for Kenneth, yes. Yeah. yeah. I'm actually in IGAD, so I'll explain a bit more on that. Yes. Terrific. Elias again, is NDVI more reliable to predict the locust emission without combining the other data? I mean, I wouldn't say that it's predicting, it's not, a, it's definitely not enough uh, as just vegetation conditions are not enough for, for talking about the invasion. There are many other factors, but it will be an indicator for if the conditions, other conditions were met, then you could say that the vegetation is, because the, the locusts eat apparently their full body, their total body weight every day. So there needs to be something to eat. And once the food runs out, that's when they start migrating. So if there is food in a certain direction, they'll keep going. Mm. Um, but I wouldn't say that you can use it as a predictor, for sure. You have, it has to be a combination. A combination, yeah. And Ratna is asking how, su how successful is the use of desert locust as animal feed? <laughs> it's a different kind of question, but maybe human feed, I don't know. Human <laughs> protein. Yeah, yeah. I, I hear that, so, well, you get served this kind of food sometimes. <laughs> um, let me see, uh, Maximilian, I see that you are using large scales yeah. Large-scale data set as MODIS and MEI, is it accurate enough to detect the locust damage, presence, etc.? Are you also using higher resolution data from Landsat or Sentinel, so combining different sources? About the field data, what are the kind of output, location maps, damage assessment, etc.? So we, um, we, one of our, one of our, one of, one of our groups within our working group is looking at HLS, the Harmonized Landsat Sentinel-2 dataset, to also look at damage, um, particularly trying to look at that rapid de uh, degradation in the NDVI in, in areas where locusts have been sighted. And that's actually showing some promising results. Um, we are also trying to, um, we've been in touch and have communicated with the Planet Labs uh, uh, company. Planet Labs is also a NASA Harvest partner and they're very interested in of course demonstrating how useful Planet Labs data is and we are looking, we're trying to see if we can do uh, assessment with Planet Labs data. So that's, we're looking at three meter resolution resolution data. But the challenge is the very high NDVI values right at the same time as invasion make it so, so complicated because it, the anomaly, even when you would look in a place that has been affected, this, the vegetation is still a lot greener even if it was eaten so much, it was still a lot greener than the long-term average. So, um, so yes, we're trying we're trying to come up with the combinations of a combination of all of these, and then come up with uh, places that have been damaged. But then, what we really hope to do in the end is help inform, for example, that FAO system that combines soil moisture, vegetation, and soil texture, that then can be used for monitoring, um, for monitoring location potential locations. Yeah. 
Okay, so I see the time is really running now, uh, and there are so many questions here also, but maybe we will take uh, more. Some of these questions will be answered by Kenneth, I think, in general. Yes. So, yes. And I'll uh, try to type as many answers as possible. Um, as, yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. So, you, so you keep on, you stay on as long as you can and read the, yes. the questions and answer, Catherine. That would be great. Yes. Thank you yes. so much. Yes. And um, we will continue uh, depending on how much time we will the pre presenters have. Uh, I can stay over, no problem for me, but maybe the others also have to leave quite soon. So we will try to go through this, uh, the presentations and see what we can do. This is great engagement. Thank you so much, everybody, by the way. <laughs> okay, Kenneth, are you ready to uh, answer more of the questions <laughs> with your presentation? <laughs> well, I'll try to answer as much. I think most of them have caught them and I'll answer them as we go on. So we will turn off our cameras again, including Kenneth, and um, and, and then we will uh, enjoy the presentation. Uh, right, uh, am I audible and can you see my screen? Yes, you can click on the hide button, yes, and then you're good to go. Go ahead. Uh, okay, okay, uh, very good. Uh, so I'll be very uh, quick so that uh, I cover as much as possible. So uh, what what I'll give is an experience of what we've been doing and the technologies we've applied, the data sets we've been using to try come up with a desert locust prediction. So this just to introduce this challenge from our perspective now, we, we uh, my institution, my organization does uh, climate forecasting. We, we do seasonal forecast, we do uh, monthly forecast, 10 day forecast, at uh, looking at key parameters of uh, like a rainfall precipitation, soil moisture also, winds. So when this challenge of desert locusts came and we had a, a lot of our networks reporting that in their cropping areas through the, through the East Africa crop monitor, that's what uh, Catherine had introduced that we are part of a geoglam uh, network that uh, does agriculture monitoring for early warning. We, we, we had to come up with quick solutions on uh, monitoring these uh, pest, uh, the pest because it's invasive to our region. Part of uh, IGAD, uh, that's uh, there are 11 countries that we monitor in the Horn of Africa. Parts of them have uh, locusts in certain season, the desert locust. But this time, due to abnormally suitable conditions, the locust now became invasive in parts that otherwise are not expected. So it, that's just introducing how we came about to now monitoring uh, the pest. So in part of agriculture monitoring, we became curious because we wanted to know, are we able to quantify the impact? Are we able to predict? Are we able to give early warning information to government on where the pests are moving to? And so that they can uh, begin early, early action and prepare. Um, to, to do that, we had to look at the winds, where the winds are moving to. That's one of the parameters that we looked at. And the things we were looking at are things we had to go through a lot of literature to learn very quickly to become desert locust experts in terms of our prediction and monitoring very quick. It was a steep learning curve, but uh, there's so much research that has been done, not in Eastern Africa, but uh, in Northern Africa, in um, the Arab Peninsula and other regions that have been, uh, scientists have been monitoring this pest and they were able to they've been able to give uh, a lot of uh, factors that determine their migration. One of them is uh, winds. Uh, basically, you find that when the locusts are mature enough and uh, they're, they're young adults to adults, they start migrating to, to areas that are now more suitable for their reproduction, for their development, so that they can go and lay eggs and develop in those areas and then migrate to another area. They also look for, for food to eat, for fresh uh, green vegetation. So we had to look at this, uh, the wind, the wind patterns, where the wind's moving to. The wind speed, the wind direction was also very important because you find there are recommended winds that, okay, not really recommended, but according to research, there are winds that uh, favor their migration or they ride onto certain winds. And you found that uh, the locusts can typically move up to 100 to 150 kilometers in a day. And uh, with the wind also, uh, in the wind direction, 
as they move towards uh, certain areas. And we're very curious to investigate what is making them move to certain areas and not other areas. Sometimes they didn't even just follow the wind. The winds will move in one direction, but you'll find they'll invade other areas or not even ride with those winds that are taking them to certain areas, but ride with other winds. So those are the questions that we're really trying to determine. So it's, for example, this map, what you can see is a, a prediction, wind prediction 5th to 15th. Uh, this is from uh, ECWMF uh, and other global models. Then we downscale to our region, uh, blend it with station data, do a bit of blending with station data to improve the model, uh, what can you say, resolution to give us very good uh, prediction for our area. Uh, in this time scale, we did this prediction every 10 days initially, and now we are doing it every 15 days, twice a month. The winds were moving towards uh, South Sudan, as you can see. And in South Sudan, they were moving southwards towards uh, Central Africa Republic. Uh, at the coast of Somalia, the winds were moving uh, southwards. And this was a very big factor in the, uh, the, the desert locust movement. What you can see mapped there, the locations are the reported locations as per that time. Uh, another, another factor we looked at when we were doing the predictions was vegetation. As Catherine had mentioned, this came at a time that there, were, there, was a uh, there was a cyclone. Actually, there was a series of cyclones, but one of them really impacted our region and caused a lot of rains that extended in a period of uh, about four, four months. And in most areas, they got up to 300% above average rains. That means the vegetation was very, very good as compared to long term. Uh, so in trying to look at the areas that they could have invaded or were suitable for the invasions, we had to look at what areas have vegetation that is above the normal conditions and put that is in an, an analytical tools. The tools that you can use for analysis, we used our own, I mean, a range of softwares. Some, some of our researchers were using R, some, some uh, were using ArcGIS, QGIS, but all, all in all, it's just the same, same things. You want to look at different factors, analyze the factors, come up with a suitability or risk maps. Uh, so that was our approach in this challenge. So in vegetation, we were looking at what is available, what, uh, what uh, vegetation was above the normal that was very suitable or making it very likely for locust invasion. And uh, for this one, uh, 15th, 25th March, we also mapped now the hoppers because now the, it became an area of interest. We wanted to know where the new hoppers so that we can also predict those hoppers that will be able to develop into adults and uh, invade other areas. I wanna, another factors, factor that we looked at was relative humidity, uh, also predictive. Uh, it was a forecast, not a prediction. It was a forecast that um, in each time period, we're looking at how will be relative humidity in the next 10 days look like. And uh, in locust development, in egg laying, there are certain conditions that are suitable for them uh, to lay their eggs and to develop, to hatch. And uh, you can also link this with soil moistures. So one of the factors we're looking at was also relative humidity. Uh, tie it down to research. What is the thresholds? What are the thresholds that research recommends or research has seen uh, promotes survival, promotes uh, rate of survival of the locust and movement and all that. Another factor, I mean, combining this factor, temperature was also very important for us because uh, temperatures, there's certain temperatures that locust, it being a desert locust and not any other locust, there are certain temperatures that uh, were suitable for them, especially in the uh, arid and semi-arid uh, areas that temperatures were typically 30 to 37 degrees. Uh, those were the areas that were favoring their population and uh, their egg laying because we found they were attracted to those areas that were hotter for egg laying. But in terms of invasion, the areas that were going to look for vegetation to feed were sometimes different. They could be found in highlands, but in the highlands, they never laid their eggs there, but they always went back to the hot areas to lay their eggs. Uh, sorry. So soils were another factor that we were looking at. This is just to explain that we had to look at uh, so many factors to try to come up with likelihood uh, in terms of movement, in terms of... Uh, uh, reproduction, copulation, egg laying. Soil was important because uh, they favor sandy soils. So percent sands and we 
found that uh, in areas that they are normally the rec uh, recession area in Sudan, what you can see, uh, very more suitable and suitable in northern Sudan. Those are areas that normally the desert locust uh, is found every 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 other season, especially during the summer breeding that they move from uh, the Arab Peninsula. You'll find most likely you'll find them in Sudan. Uh, and now the, these new parts that we were seeing egg laying, like in Kenya, western uh, eastern Kenya, parts of Somalia, northern Somalia, Djibouti, and Ethiopia. We found a high correlation between the the sandy soils, sandy composition, and where they were they they laid eggs. So so far, uh, just to talk to the participants that these are ongoing research. We are really trying to merge a lot of earth observation data that is not just remote sensing, combined with ground data, combined with a done study like soil soil data, soil moisture, satellite derived non satellite derived to try to come up with a. Uh, information that can be used for early warning and to advise. So typically our movement prediction based on winds, based on uh, invasion, invaded areas, based on, uh, we came up with these risk maps that show very high uh, uh, areas with high, very high moderate risk for the invasion. And also based on the wind movement, wind speeds, we came up with uh, these uh, predictions where the locusts might move to. It didn't always work according to the prediction, but largely we were able to advise or to give early warning information because it was a sort of based on focus. So it was a prediction and it came out very well. Uganda used the information very well, the government of Uganda, although their, their uh, capability, I mean, their capacity to control the pest was uh, limited at that time, but uh, due to like calling on different actors at the time, to support FAO came out very well and many other actors came out very well to support the control measures. Uh, these maps act, acted as a good guide on where the pest might be moving to, what is happening, where hatching is happening, where hoppers uh, have been spotted. So among the challenges, um, this, this is just a match comparing two predictions where we started like a match on March 5th to 15th and the most current prediction that we released uh, two days ago, 1st to 15th April how it looks like. The winds have changed and now they're pushing the locust back up to countries like Ethiopia, uh, South Sudan and Sudan. Uh, back on the coast of Eritrea, the pest, because there's a lot of hoppers development, they are now being taken by the winds to the Arab Peninsula. And uh, parts northern of Somalia, they are, they are going back to the Red Sea. And you might find that the Arab Peninsula should be ready for our next invasion. Uh, Ethiopia also, in parts of Ethiopia, we are seeing a lot of cropland in Ethiopia at risk. Uh, th that's looking at the map on the right because that's the most current prediction. So I, I know I've covered a lot of uh, technical terms, a lot of, uh, but just summarizing, that's what we were trying to do. Among the challenges or the gaps that we were having, Catherine mentioned a lot of them, early detection of such pests, early warning, and uh, to come up with actionable advisories. And initially we had the case whereby we'll give Ali, we'll try to gather all the information we're getting, pest location where, been, where they've been reported. There are no open source tools that we can, we, we can use at this point that uh, many people can report and everyone can use such tools for their own analysis. I mean, the locations rep reported, the swarms reported. Uh, that, that was a big gap because we had to rely a lot on crowdsourced information from media, uh, from uh, other organizations. Typically government data came, in, came with a seven to 14 de days delay. That means by the time we are waiting for government reports that show where the locusts has invaded, already it's about seven days late and the locusts have moved up to 2,000 to 3,000 kilometers across the mass of land. So it wasn't good for early warning purposes. Uh, one of the areas that we also really working on is uh, to detect or to map the impacts. We're trying to map the impacts, what to, to quantify what amount of vegetation might have, might have been destroyed. But as Catherine said, since the pest invaded at a time, invaded at a time that vegetation was very lush, you'll find that there was minimal or non, almost low level detectable vegetation dips. But with higher resolution with Sentinel, we are also hoping that we can be able to catch some of that. And uh, for actually future studies such that 
future tools can have the early detection capability. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Kenneth. And you, uh, towards the end there, you really underlined the importance of even near real time ground data yeah. in situ data to yeah. uh, it, it's and it's very very challenging across all fields but you see that it's a definitely a high value in the in the locus case uh, it's very very easy to understand the value of it um, i because of the because of the time here we are already four minutes over the hour so I suggest that we give the floor to Dennis and then have the discussion afterwards so that those who have to go actually benefit from the talk of, of Dennis. And uh, what we don't have time to do of discussion in this webinar, I'm sure uh, if you join the challenge, you will have plenty of time to discuss uh, and, and elaborate. But Dennis, uh, thank you, Kenneth, so much. Um, and Dennis, uh, I give the floor to you. So, so that we uh, we managed to to cover the most of it um, before people have to go. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so let me set this up. Yeah, we remove ourselves again. The cameras, yes, me included. <laughs> now we will at the local, regional, more the regional scale. Oh, you, you had the screen sharing on and then you are unshare your screen, Dennis, and we don't hear you even, we don't even, we don't hear you. <laughs> okay, here we go. Yes. 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 So hello again, everyone. Um, the good thing about speaking last is that most of your speakers ahead of you have, have, have touched on what you <laughs> probably are going to talk about. Um, the good thing is that I'm going to rush very fast. Um, and because much of this information has already been shared by Catherine and also by Ken, who we work very closely with. And so I want to um, just run you through what we we did um early on when 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 the need for mapping and monitoring the desert locust uh, came um from different partners around east africa um and so the history has already been uh, addressed by by uh, catherine and, and ken but generally you know what the, the fourth four ecological conditions that we have been helping with monitoring are rainfall, winds, soil moisture, and vegetation. And strongly for RCMR, the uh, rainfall and vegetation uh, conditions are what we have been assisting our partners who need this information. And I saw one of the questions from Ade uh, about where they can get this data. So um, these are quick maps of, of what we, we can do. Um, we have a platform, an online platform, uh, but we call an early warning explorer. That's where we share most ad observation data, um, rainfall, vegetation, temperature. And this is a platform that is accessible to everyone. And it's a platform where you can download data freely and you can use them. And more, most of this data is in, um, in, in a format that mapping you know, technicians or experts can, can use or can plug in into their software. Uh, it also has uh, different capabilities of, of uh, generating statistics. And, and for instance, if you want to know the trends in rainfall for a particular period of time or, or vegetation or any NDVI in this case, you can you can pick a region of interest and you can generate that time series and you can download it for, for further use. So we did this early on, you know, beginning in January this year um, when we got a request from the Ministry of Agriculture in Kenya. And what we, we the questions that were uh that, that that were leading our, our, our response to them are can we be able to detect areas where there are anomalous rainfall um, events and can we also identify areas where there are anomalous uh, vegetation conditions 
And those two questions are very critical then in, in the responses that we provide to the menace. And fortunately, from our data portal, we were able to respond to these uh, uh, questions by providing outlooks of how rainfall was distributed, distributed across the region and how conditions or vegetation conditions or vegetation generally was responding to that rainfall. And the motivation here was that, like Ken mentioned, like uh, uh, also uh, Catherine mentioned, is that you require, you know, rainfall to drive vegetation greenness. You require soil moisture that sustains that vegetation uh, greenness. And you also require to have um, We seem to have trouble with the sound. Dennis? Kizito, hmm. uh, do you hear? Uh, no, I think I've, all, I've also lost him on my side. It, was, yeah. I was... it, it sounds like the internet connection might be the reason. Several period. Oh my goodness. I can hear you very well. Okay, so Dennis. I think he got kicked out, but then he should he come, be back. He's coming back. And Dennis. Dennis need to turn on the microphone and the camera again. Well, not the camera, but the microphone. And then he left the room again. <laughs> it's probably the uh, internet connection, folks. So. Hi there, he's back. He's back. It looks like everybody's back. Yeah. Um, so okay. Dennis is coming back also. Okay. Where he left off. But you have to remember to to unmute yourself also, Dennis. All right, sorry, babe. sorry, sorry for that. Uh, might be the internet connection, but I hope everyone can hear me now. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. So what I was saying, you know, so we started this monitoring for Kenya specifically uh, when the situation started to escalate and the, the invasions came from the Northeast. And so we were able to, to collect data from the fields, uh, you know, aggregating information that we could access from media reports, uh, others that, are, well, that were being reported by the ministry, and we were able to map counties or areas in the counties that the sightings were, were, were um, or the desert locusts were sighted. And so from this information, then it was easy for us to provide uh, kind of other observation data that are focused then on showing what is happening in those counties and why the invasions were there. And like I mentioned, you know, there were three key conditions, ecological conditions that we were monitoring. We were looking at the soil moisture for obvious reasons that Catherine and Ken mentioned. Um, we were monitoring the vegetation as a driver of, of food uh, for these locusts. Um, and also we were looking at what we can see from wind patterns in the region and what we could forecast to be uh, um, the situation or the outlook in, in coming you know, uh, 15 or so days. Um, one big advantage of our data portal, and I'm going to provide a link to this, is that um, you can quickly uh, you know, summarize different statistics that you're interested in. For instance, if you want to know how situations at the present period compare with situations in the past, or what the average conditions of a locations are, of a location are, then you are able to do that. And then you are also given the capability to, uh, to, 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 so to select what time period you require. If you want, um, you know, five days in the past. If you want one month in the past, three months in the past, then you are able to do that from our data port. And you are able also to download these as, as images, as maps that you can use in your reports. Um, the other thing is that um, we have a product, uh, a rainfall forecast product that tells you what the situation in terms of rainfall amount is going to be in, in the next 15 days 
from the present day. And this information is very, very important. And like Ken mentioned, and like also uh, uh, Catherine mentioned, is that you know you cannot predict or yeah predict the movement of of, of these locusts by just looking at one indicator. It has to be a combination of several indicators. And fortunately, satellites give us that capacity to to have these over very large areas. And then also you require field data. You require field data for you to be able to train your models and to be able to you know, uh, also validate your model outputs. And so from our, our data portal, you can access rainfall products uh, or rainfall focus product uh, that tells you the situation in the next 15 days and using that and several other uh, indicators uh, like uh, ICPAC is doing, you, you, you can, you know, you can predict with some 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 level of, of uh, certainty of where the locusts are likely going to move. Uh, of course, it's a probability in some way, but then, you know, because of what we have seen in the past and what we are learning from, from what we are doing, then we are gaining that confidence that actually our models can predict to some degree where likely the invasions or infestations are going to be in the coming days. Uh, I will provide this link uh, and, and the presentation, um, but I wanted to say that one of the biggest challenge, uh, again, is can we map where the damage has been? And this is a very difficult question. And it's also a very, uh, I can say it's an opportunity for, for opportunity for research, because one thing is that we are observing the, the rainfall season last year, the short rains were very anomalous in a means. So they were positively anomalous. So, it, you know, it, we had too much rainfall than we have had in, in the past uh, uh, three or so decades. Uh, and, or two, two or so de decades, sorry. And that has contributed to having a very lush uh, vegetation, um, very good vegetation conditions that are keeping the swarms around East Africa. And so the, the amount of detail that we can pick from satellite imagery for mapping damage or assessing damage uh, you know, is limited. And so one of the questions that we have been asking ourselves at ASIMADI is that, is vegetation rege regeneration outdoing the desert locust invasion? It's it's a question that still requires a response, and and colleagues like Catherine Ashford are trying to investigate that. And and the intention, the objective here is to be able to to map damage that is associated with the invasions as accurately as we can. The other thing is that while we would need field data, and while the situation at the moment because of uh, the COVID and several other uh, factors is making it difficult to collect field data. But we still have people who are out there. How how well can we use them to report data from the fields, to report where the sightings are, what the, the, the damages are? And I, I picked uh, a concept from the sea, um, you know, ships of opportunity. Can we use pastoralists who move around with their livestock? Can we use them to report what is happening in the field? And if if the answer is yes, how best can we use these pastoralists? as people of opportunity to send us data that we can use to uh, train our models and, and validate our outputs. So that's generally what I wanted to talk about today, uh, and I'll be happy to provide more information when required. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. <laughs> um, there's a lot of uh, um, information and a lot of work done, but I think it's also clear that there are multiple challenges still to be addressed and uh, we have this hackathon and this the challenge uh, where we can work on this. I see that we we are so we are 20 almost 20 minutes um, above uh, our initial time and there are so many good questions in the chat box. Uh, but I think because of this timing, I think it's uh, better to take uh, and answer these questions and that you can engage in the in the challenge uh, through the Skype 
uh, call the Sky Channel. But before, I will recommend so to facilitate the work of uh, Kisito and the other mentors. I recommend that you register for the challenge because that's the way for you to get all the communication, not only what happens in the chat. Is that you agree with me on this, Kisito? Yes, exactly. So uh, please, everybody, go to the link where you register for uh, the hackathon, and you need to select the Desert Locust Challenge. And once you do that, then you will also get um, a late email, which um, which will then also give you some details about uh, the hackathon. You will then get access to our Google Drive um, uh, box where folder where we are working. Um, and you also get access to more materials. So I suggest that um, anybody who is interested to continue with this uh, challenge to first register for the challenge. And uh, we will also paste these questions also in our um, in our challenge Skype um, Skype group and uh, invite uh, the experts also to basically give us the feedback that they were that they that that that, uh, that, that we are that we are still looking for from the questions and then we can put them in that challenge uh, in the in the Skype group. Yeah. Yes, and I I just pasted the link directly to the description of the challenge where you also find a button where you can directly register for for the for the challenge and uh, Kisito he I, I'm I'm going to help you here Kisito <laughs> we, we uh, um, you will you will need um, so Kisito and the other mentors will need a little bit of background from you so you will get, get an email where you are kindly requested to provide some information about you know your background your, your skills your knowledge your interest and also your time and capacity to work on the challenge exactly yeah yes and uh, also a word for for the final the finale of this hackathon just to mention that because we need to update the general information on the website so since you are here we will use the opportunity to tell you that we started as we, we normally have a virtual phase of the Inspire hackathons. But in this case, because of the virus situation, we had to cancel the Kampala um, on site, both uh, the hackathon and uh, final workshop. So the Kampala, the, the Kampala name is, is because we were planning to actually go to Kampala, <laughs> but uh, we will virtually be in Kampala and um, at the ending as well. So there will be a final workshop uh, on the 6th of May. It says normally we would have been in the program of East Africa conference on the 8th of May, which you had in your slide, uh, Kisito. Yes. But uh, the virtual event replacing that will take place on the 6th of May. But just follow, follow Plan for All on Twitter or and, and be a part of the uh, by all means register for the um, the challenge and you will get all the updated information um, just to mention that and if you are unfamiliar with working in the remote hackathon we we realize that this is not somebody something everybody's do, doing all the time so we have provided some guidelines on what it means to be participating in a virtual hackathon you know how what exactly are you going to do so we we have some slides i will send them to you as well casito so that you can share them in in the group otherwise we have it already on the plan for all yeah. uh, EU website okay yes. yes we will also send that via email to everybody who registers uh, or yep. everybody who has already registered yes yes okay any um any final words from the rest of the the panel here Maybe a short summary from my end, I think, and, and this is to the participants, um, uh, to those who are potentially going to participate in the hackathon, is that from this session, we've, we have a very good grasp of the tools and data and information that is available from all the ongoing efforts within East and Southern Africa, um, and the perspectives from the experts in the region. And it is very clear that now uh, they have additional information to structure uh, their challenges and to think about the best way to contribute without already, you know, uh, filling into the existing uh, set of information uh, through the gaps that we have been able to identify. And when I looked at the gaps, there are three things um, I'd like maybe to highlight as we end. 
And what is clear is that there is a challenge with the targeted playing. How effective is it? How timely is it? But the issues also of coordination, data and information is not really well streamlined. But again, in issues of mapping impact and mapping the damage that is ongoing. But the other most critical information is crowdsourcing of data. And this is a summary from all the four different uh, uh, for the, from the different presentations. How do we leverage on all the existing sources to get timely information that will improve the decisions that are being made and that will add on all already existing efforts to improve decision making and management of the desert low cost. So I think this is food for thought and my takeaways from this meeting. So thank you. Thank you very much, Lillian, for that very valuable summary. <laughs> Of, of challenges or, or, or gaps that we that can be addressed in this uh, yeah. in this team. Yeah. Yes. So with that, I think we can close the webinar. Thank you so much to everybody attending and your active participation. We promise this what you have asked and commented is really valuable, and we we have a record of it, so we will use reuse this information. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a good weekend. Yeah. Bye-bye.